It is 1900. It is 3 p.m. Some rainy Saturday on some windswept hill. It could be anywhere in the country, but it isn't. Among the little cottages in the middens, here at the very edge of the Ayrshire coalfield, two little villages sit on the hillside. Lethen Hill and Burnfoot Hill are yards apart. For the people who live there, they're the same. Your team playing the Fitba Park at Lethen Hill is probably closer to your house than some of the cottages there. This is the first time that Ben Watt Heatherbell have been to your home ground at Primrose Park since that Rammy at Rugby Park in the final of the Ayrshire Junior Cup last season, but that all seems to have been put to bed, aside from the evil eye you're getting from one of their halfbacks. You're pretty sure he had more teeth the last time you saw him. Time always stands still before a big game. You have time to look around at the faces in the crowd. It's a hell of a big crowd. Men and women looking on with pride as you take to the pitch. Your mum and dad are there. Mum looking proud and dad looking like steam's about to start shooting out of his ears like the wee puffer that comes up and down the line to move the crudely processed pig iron. He gives the Ben Watt players what for. Nothing ever changes. You look round at your teammates, ten of your best friends all dressed in gleaming white kits. Getting them looking like that after playing on the junior parks of the coalfields every weekend was a labour of love. Every Monday your mother would work all day in the steamy, with all the other players' maws bringing white shirts as pure as driven snow, back from the brink of destruction. She wouldn't have her boy turning out like he'd just come up out the pit. I mean, you looked like that every other day. The boys are ready. No first names on the field. We Billy and Big Jim are McDowell and Hyatt. They exist out of time, out of place, for 90 minutes. No identities beyond the men you trust most in the world. The pride of the hill. The ball sits under your foot, and as you roll it around under the tackety boot that you think is state of the art, you feel the weight of it. The heavy, strapped leather. The lacing to keep the inflated ball in. It hurts like hell when you go up for a header on a cold day. And it's cold today. There's the weight of expectation too. As you watch the referee walk out to the middle of the pitch, his smart blazer whistle and watch out of place against the surroundings. Every Saturday. Referees. Best dressed men on the hill. And suddenly everything comes back into sharp focus. The white of your kit. The blue of theirs. The roar of the crowd. This is Scotland. A podcast about history and where we made it. I'm Michael Park. Football is your pride. These tiny villages... The hill, as you call them, are your passion, your home, your people. You and your mates have dragged the primrose up and taken them to a final. Among the heather bells, the dunes, the meadows, the mountaineers, the shawbanks, the cherry pickers, and all the others. The primrose are a name. Sure, you didn't win the final. The other lot took that 2-1, but it could have been worse. You went in at half-time 2-0 down in front of 400 people. The Ayrshire Junior Final Tie This event came off at Rugby Park Colmarnock on Saturday, and considering the big attraction at Ayr the same afternoon, the attendance of spectators was very gratifying, over £15 being realised out of the proceedings, though this sum is less than last season. Last year, the finalists for this trophy were Irvine Meadow 11 and New Milnes, the former winning by four goals to nil, but on Saturday the contending teams were new aspirants, vis-a-vis Ben Watt and Burnford Hill. It was generally expected that the game would have a close issue, and in this respect at least few were disappointed, but when contrasted with the final of the previous season, the exposition given by the respective sides was somewhat inferior. During the first half, Ben Watt played with the assistance of a strong wind and had the monopoly of the play during that stage. Burnford Hill, however, offered a good defence, and when a halt was called, Ben Watt had only secured a lead of two goals against nil for their opponents. 
The change of ends now saw Burnfoot Hill pretty much in evidence. In fact, play was conducted on somewhat similar lines to the first half, only Burnfoot Hill were the main aggressors. They, however, scored but on one occasion, and Benpot were thus hailed junior champions of the Shire by the narrow margin of two goals to one. The game was to the rough side, and for this the referee was to blame, having allowed the players too much rope. At the close of the game, which was good value for a draw, several of the players quarrelled, and a pugilistic display closed the day's proceedings. The teams were Benwatt, Tate, Torbett, Hunter, Hannah, McHatty, Watt, McCready... You Martin, were definitely one of the players quarrelling at the end of the game. Whether you were one of the men engaged in a pugilistic display, well, that was between you and the big man with no front teeth. If you enjoy what we're doing on Scotland, then one of the best things you can do to help us out is to leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. Um, we still don't know how to do it on other apps. Some of them do it, some of them don't. Uh, but if you do have access to Apple Podcasts, that super helps us out. Also, we offer a Patreon, which is a cool little way to support us and get some extra stuff from Scotland. We just added a load of merch, which we're hopefully going to send out soon. If you want to support us on Patreon, we really appreciate every dollar we get. It makes such a difference to us, and it means that essentially the podcast can pay for itself, which is super important. If you fancy that, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Scotland History Podcast. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the show. Rivalries between companies between villages, between communities and individuals were lived out in the FIPA pitch. Your best 11 against their best 11. A pure, unsurpassed expression of bragging rights between people who had more to connect them than separate them. Your mind might produce iron ore. Their mind might bring up coal. Maybe they work in the furnaces at the works, or haul ore down the hills on the Domellington Railway. Football was pride. It's your way to show what your community is all about. On the pitch, all bets are off. Off the pitch, you probably live much the same lives, in much the same wee houses as all the guys on the other team. Your livelihood, your home, your life was at the whim of the company that built your row, your kids' school, the church you go to on a Sunday, the pub you enjoy a foaming pint of ale in after the football finishes. You live at the whim of whatever comes out of the ground. Iron is the lifeblood of the community and it keeps everything running. As long as the iron works down the hill at Danaskin have pig iron to process, you'll have your life as you always knew it. A life that sees sheep graze among the miners' rows, the wains running about barefoot whenever they weren't at the wee school, which sits at the head of the village. The train brings in supplies every week and the train takes the iron stone and the pig iron out of the pits, which are dug into every available bit of the hill, even two right in the centre of the village. But there would come a day, there would come a time. In 1913 the Ayrshire Miners Union published a report into conditions in the Ayrshire Miners Rose. Its report on the hill said, the lack of conveniences at this large village is disgraceful, and not worthy of such an important company as the Delmellington Iron Co. Limited. The people in every row gave evidence of being able to appreciate better conditions. We trust those conditions will be given to them. The ironworks down the hill at Danaskin closed in 1921. They were clapped out. The workers were in need of new equipment and better conditions too. They went on strike. And that was that. Gone. Until it was made into a brickworks a few years later. By the 1930s, all the miners rose in the surrounding areas, but especially on the hill were struggling and were in dire need of renovation as the last vestiges of the old way of mining continued its slow decline, giving way to the open cast pits, which brought out more iron, but destroyed the landscape. When the Second World War ended, the writing was already on the wall for the hill. In 1954, the remaining residents of the Rose were rehomed in new estates being built in nearby Patna. 
The last to go was the village's oldest resident, Rab Price. He eventually moved off the hill, but only under protest. The school stayed open for a while as the last few buildings untouched by demolition decayed in front of the children. Burnfoot Hill was given over to the open cast mines, and the entire village is now a series of giant holes in the ground. Lethen Hill was planted with trees, and if you wander through the plantation, you can still see the odd wall poking out of the undergrowth. Venture further up the wee road from Patna, and you'll find a TV transmission tower, piping signals into homes across the southwest. But in its shadow lies a stone, on which, painted in stark black letters with a white outline, are two dates and four words. 1851 to 1954. Long live the hill. You've been listening to Scotland. It was written and produced by me, Michael Park, and is a production of Be Quiet Media. Thank you to Brian McCall of the Scottish Football Historical Archive for helping us find out more about Burnfoot Hall Primrose. Additional voices in this episode were by Chris Moriarty. The music for every episode of Scotland is by the human open cast mine Mitch Bain. You can check out more of his work at mitchbain.bequiet.media. Jamie Mowat does stunning illustrations for us, which you can see in our episode art. See more and buy prints at tidlin, T-I-D-L-I-N dot com. Scotland is supported by Chris Lingwood and listeners like you on Patreon. Get involved for as little as $2 a month at patreon.com forward slash Scotland History Podcast. You can find out more about the show on our website, thisisscotland.co, and on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram by searching Scotland, Scottish History Podcast. Thanks for listening. Look after one another. Keep wearing your mask. We'll see you next time.